So SmartSparrow is an adaptive learning platform, which basically means that we're trying our darndest to create a, an experience that meets the needs of as many different students as possible. Um, and in order to do that, you really do need to look at different um, theories of learning and you really need to dive into how do we reach the student that is really ahead of the game and challenge them and you need to really look at the students that are struggling and need um, some bolstering up and um, so that's kind of where we're at it's it's very much um, a lot of times we've thrown around personalization um, I'm not a huge fan of that word. I prefer the word differentiation. Um, I think that Smart Sparrow and its platform does a really great job of differentiating for each student. So meeting the student where the student is and going ahead and helping them move forward in some kind of way. Welcome to another Resiliency Roundtable from the Northeast Resiliency Consortium, actually known as the NRC. My name is Ed Fyans. I'm the content specialist here for the LEAD team. If you want to learn more about the NRC, you can actually uh, jump backwards to the first podcast that we have here in the list on SoundCloud, and you can get a quick little overview before you jump back to where we are now. And what, who we're going to hear from today is actually someone not from one of our schools, but is a very, very crucial part of our team. Her name is Heather Newlin. She is an instructional designer for a company called Smart Sparrow. They are an educational technology startup. They originated out of Australia. We'll be talking to Heather uh, while she is in California. That's where she works. And what Smart Sparrow is building for us, uh, and there, it's kind of their thing, is a adaptive online learning they have a suite of tools on their on their base out of their site but they also do custom jobs like they're doing for us they're building two groups of tools for us one of them is affectionately known as the dot lessons and you'll hear more about what that is in a little bit the other group is called we call them bundles which are subject specific lessons whereas the dot lessons are more general resiliency lessons that could fit into any class at any point any time so the bundles are going to be grouped as uh, for uh, information technology, uh, our EMT psychological trauma prevention training, and the third one is student success, which are kind of in between sort of the general ones and the subject specific ones in terms of uh, their uh, ability to kind of be dropped in anywhere. But uh, we wanted to make lessons that were specific to first year college or first time college students, maybe first generation college students, even the folks that really need to, to, to learn about how to do colleging or how to do studenting to, to make a really to kind of mess with the language a little bit you know how to be a student how to how to do college because it is a very very different you know, way of being in a lot of ways so without further ado you'll be hearing from Alex Scheinert who is the communications assistant as well as myself speaking with instructional designer for Smart Heather we want to know what, and this is something we ask everybody, your job title is instructional designer, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what would you describe for us what a resilient instructional designer does or how they are? A resilient instructional designer. Yeah. What are the qualities <laughs> um, of a resilient instructional designer? Again, everyone gets this as their first question, so. <laughs> A resilient instructional designer. Well, I suppose that an instructional designer goes ahead and looks at different content areas and figures out how to uh, teach, usually online. <laughs> um, and I'd say a resilient instructional designer is kind of pushing the envelope is not afraid to fail 
and try some new things that maybe don't work out very well, um, but is willing to take that chance and uh, throw some different types of lessons out there and see what sticks, see what doesn't and then refine the process, you know, bounce back up and uh, give it another shot. What's that feedback like? How does that, how does that, how would you say that happens? I mean, are you getting that from students? I mean, in your, again, in your line of work, so to speak, um, that, that kind of, oh, <laughs> this sounds like, this is, what does failure look like? How does it come back? <laughs> what does failure look like? Um, well, typically we put out, we kind of create a learning experience and then we release the first iteration of it to instructors and students. Uh, students go ahead and give it a shot, instructors give it a shot, and uh, we look at a couple of things. We look at, one, kind of their general reaction. We ask them to, to speak to us about what their general feeling is about the lessons that they took. The second thing is we look at their, uh, we look at their data that we're kind of pulling. And uh, sometimes you have students that say, oh yeah, this is, this is great. And then you look at the data and it's just not digging deep enough or it's not hitting uh, the notes that you want to hit or it's not clear enough. Uh, sometimes the data shows, yeah, this is really great, and they're getting all of the info that we need them to get, but when we ask them about the experience, they feel let down. So it's trying to find something that's truly engaging, truly inspiring for students, and at the same time has all of the robustness that we need um, for them to walk away having gained new knowledge and and uh, feeling confident about a specific content area. How is your background as a teacher kind of informing informing that, would you say? Like, I, I kind of wanted to get, uh, have you kind of go on record and kind of talk about you as a teacher in the, in the, in the physical classroom as a mm -hmm. point for how you think about this online stuff. Um, I'm, definitely, <laughs> I'm definitely a classroom teacher at heart. And I think that my classroom experiences, um, my background inside the classroom pushes me to, to think in terms of new things that are possible for online learning. I think that um, a lot of online learning experiences uh, can be quite similar. <laughs> Um, and I don't think that we've even started to tap into all of this amazing knowledge that uh, student or uh, instructors inside the classroom have about different um, pedagogical strategies, different um, practices that they have in place, and we haven't even started to, to really map out how can we effectively use some of those strategies. And I feel like having been inside the classroom for a long enough period of time, I have a pretty big bag of tricks that I can pull from. And um, then it just one? becomes, pardon? Could, could you name it? Could you have an example? Sure. Um, I, when I was teaching and writing curriculum for inside the classroom, I was very much a project-based uh, like student-centered, uh, constructivist type of teacher. What were you teaching and, specifically? Which, what, what level? Oh lord! <laughs> um, <laughs> or at least the most I, recent. <laughs> the most recent was uh, I ha was teaching continuation high school students. Uh, I was teaching them uh, integrating English and social studies and visual arts and creating courses that combined all three of those things together. I feel like I, I take a lot of those experiences where I'm kind of looking at what are best practices inside of the classroom and I'm trying to, to figure out how to 
bring them to life online, which, you know, some things are going to fit really nicely and some things you just really need to have that um, in-person experience. So it's just trying to find which ones work and which ones don't. Going back to this idea of differentiation and personalization, I feel like we are offering a differentiated approach for each student, but what makes uh, what we're doing with our partnership with uh, the NRC so um, unique and groundbreaking is that it is, we are looking to personalize it. So it's not just differentiated instruction in terms of, oh, let's see what level you're at and we're going to get you uh, to a better level wherever you start at. It also is really grounding it in personal experience, um, what the student is going through in their own lives, um, how the content relates to their background knowledge, and um, getting them to understand why some of these resiliency components are important and how they can improve using um, some of these things or keeping them in mind. And, and that's, I really think, taking um, online learning and adaptive learning to a whole different level. It is differentiating, but it, it is creating this personal experience that is very hard to achieve. Uh, yeah, and it, the, can, you, can you talk for a second about the technology itself? Um, obviously, this is an audio format, so you can't, <laughs> we can't show anybody anything, though, you know, I mean, we can, we can obviously Certainly do links. Yeah, we can share it. But mm -hmm. um, what is it about adaptive? Because, I mean, I can go on to the Internet, the amazing Internet, and learn things from it. Mm -hmm. But the, what is it about the adaptive technology itself wow. that really creates the kind of experience you're describing? Because it's not enough just, I mean, like, what you were describing with sort of uh, the, 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 um, the student is allowed to draw upon their own personal experience. What is it, what is it about adaptive? Because I, I can type something into Tumblr, into like a Tumblr diary. You know, like that's me putting down my personal experience. So what what is mean? it about adaptive that really is married so well to that particular pedagogical strategy? Well, I think that, I think that a lot of times what people overlook is how, well, it, in terms of how we construct our knowledge, a lot of it is based on our prior beliefs, a lot of it is based on, uh, you know, what we've learned before, what's come before, and so we enter into a new learning experience with a whole host of biases, a whole host of beliefs, whether or not they be correct or incorrect, and what adaptive learning allows you to do is uh, look for specific misconceptions that students may be having and, and then address those misconceptions. So if, if I just say go on the internet and you know, look up uh, something about active listening, you can probably go on the internet and you're going to read several articles. Now, you probably are going to approach those articles with a lens that um, maybe there's a lot of confirmation bias there, um, maybe there's uh, an aspect of protecting your ego and protecting um, how you see yourself. If we go ahead and we enter into something where they are asked to explore that within the adaptive learning platform, then it eliminates a little bit of that. Not, not totally. You could still get feedback <laughs> from our system and say, oh, forget that. <laughs> I'm totally fine. I, I'm great at active listening. Um, <laughs> but it does start to identify places where you might, you, you might start to see some blind spots that you have in your own understanding of yourself. And I think that's where it, it becomes really powerful. So let's talk about the reflective writing component because I know it's it's something that you you guys are taking and using in another project um, speak to sort of why in your opinion what makes it so successful 
it is it's certainly I think in all the different kinds of things or like the, the the different kinds of things you're making for us it stands out as the the one thing that they all have in common so to speak so I'd love to hear what you know kind of the 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 how reflective learning why it became so important um, well, as we were going through, and again, it, it, it hits on this, this idea, this, um, the difference between differentiation and personalization. And we started really looking at what we did well, but what are some of the ways that we could, you know, really push the boundaries of online learning. And we felt that there wasn't enough time spent having the students think about their own learning process, doing all of the metacognitive activities that a lot of times you do in discussions inside the classroom when you really unpack things. Um, and when you have students kind of answer deep probing questions. And a lot of online learning doesn't, it's not usually deep and probing. <laughs> No um, because a lot of online learning is based on whether or not you can, um, you know, answer a particular question in a, in a multiple choice setting or a true false, um, something along that line. Um, so to ask students to, to move beyond that and to really think and, and stretch and, and be a critical thinker uh, I think is so important. Um, whether or not you can analyze it or not, I, th I think that uh, the act itself is vitally important for solidifying information and for um, taking students to the next level in terms of making connections, uh, cross-disciplinary con connections, connections within their life. And so, it felt like that was where we really needed to go. And so we've been playing around with how uh, you can be reflective um, with kind of these open-ended probing questions and you can be reflective verbally. We're playing around with how you can be um, creative and reflective using images or sound bites or videos. Um, so I, I think that that's kind of the next step for online learning, and we were really excited to kind of jump in and explore that. Start at the beginning in terms of when you receive the, the, the five competencies. Reflective learning, self-awareness, collaboration, adaptability, and critical thinking. Well, there you Got go. Got them all. Hey. So when you receive those, you know, definitions and all that, the, the model itself and those, those five definitions, Walk us going from there to the sort of list of list of the general lessons, and then kind of how what you've made of the general lessons, how that works going back out towards the competencies on the other side. We looked at the five competencies uh, originally, and you know, I'd I'd like to say that we were all just brilliant little people sitting in a room and we came up with uh, this whole list, but actually the consortium itself came up with uh, a list of contributing factors for each of the five uh, resiliency components. And so what we did was we kind of dug through um, this long list that the consortium had created and we kind of looked at those things um, that we felt were like were the essential elements, uh, the essential building blocks to each component. At the same time, we cross-referenced this with um, a lot of things that we were reading about um, employability skills and what uh, people are looking for in future, you know, future workers. And so we kind of started to cross-reference that and um, keep in mind that, uh, you know, the mission really is to get people uh, out into the workforce and be successful there. So from all of that, we kind of narrowed down the scope uh, to these 
elements that we felt pointed to and clarified each of the, uh, the components. So from there, it, it also became very interesting because each of these are so interwoven. Um, it, they really are very reliant upon each other. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was my, like the thing the the you can't have critical, you can't really critical think critically think without being self-aware. You know, you can't really. It was very true. Yeah, stuff like that, where it's like, the, yeah, you can't collaborate without the ability to be adaptable. <laughs> you know, like that there was there was a kind of feedback loop with all of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that w what you'll notice throughout the lessons is things continually um, fold in upon each other and um, kind of boost each other up. Uh, if you are going to be looking at um, flexibility and you're going to look at planning. It's interesting. Those are ones in critical thinking as we have it mapped. Planning is in critical thinking. Uh, flexibility is in adaptability. Um, but if you really think about it, both of them sort of play off each other in this very interesting way. And so they're going to pop up. There's going to be discussion around each of them uh, within the different lessons. And that's the, how this works. And I think that's what makes um, this a very interesting course. If you were to take all of the lessons together, um, I think that they play off each other in a very interesting way. And they kind of prove or they point to the fact that that everything kind of contributes to resiliency in this very tight web and um, so I, I you know I'm a big fan of what the consortium had done there I wasn't there when they had mapped out all of these things but they really do make sense um, and they really uh, kind of strengthen one another the is there something I mean, we talked about um, the reflective, I mentioned the reflective writing thing, which is obviously reflective learning, kind of one-to-one. -one. Is there anything mm -hmm. of, can you speak to another kind of task where the doing of the thing in the context of the lesson can also, like you said, flexibility lends itself to adaptability, but that's sort of the content of the lesson. Is there anything mm -hmm. like within the lesson that you could speak to specifically like a, uh, like the idea cloud, for instance, or something like that, that you would code as something else as an example. Again, obviously, the reflective writing component is reflective learning, but something that wouldn't necessarily be as obvious. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are, well, I would say there's a very strong strain of self-efficacy, uh, which will be a particular lesson, but it is a strain that weaves its way um, through almost all of the lessons. Um, I think there is an element that the whole self-awareness component um, of the strengths and weaknesses, I think that that's something that it, when we go and we um, kind of uh, map out how these things fall out within each lesson, uh, you're going to see strengths and weaknesses come up a lot as well. Um, because you're addressing that through each of these uh, elements. I think that there's components of um, flexibility uh, about and uh, reflection in that idea cloud that are going to come up again and again, no matter what you're thinking about. Um, I think that each one of them will show up multiple times throughout the different lessons. Yeah, and the, and the idea cloud, for anyone listening that doesn't know what we were just referring to, um, could you actually, well, why am I going to explain it? You, yeah, can you idea, explain what the idea cloud is quickly? In every lesson. Because they're not going to be looking for They're, they're not going to be looking <laughs> sure. at it. Sure. Um, so the original idea for the idea cloud um, came to me as I was thinking about how we can um, creatively ask students to 
uh, consider their prior knowledge and to uh, help them understand their growth over time. So at the beginning of a lesson, we ask students uh, to think about what they what their beliefs are about a particular topic. So what are your beliefs about logic? And there are a series of uh, images and words that they can choose from, and they populate this map of what, what they're thinking. Um, and it may not be exactly, it may not be a precise map. You know, when I was first envisioning this, uh, when sky's the limit, I really wanted something where, um, they could pull any image off the internet and take an, any audio clip from a speech and they could uh, have YouTube yeah. clips in there. And it would just be this um, amazing board of understanding. And um, of course, there are technical limitations. And I have to, you know, any, any innovation, you gotta, gotta take it one step at a time. And the engineers were like, whoa, Nelly. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> but the, um, but that's like the but that's the kind of bold thinking thing. Like we're gonna get to the there's the next big bold idea, the germ for where the okay. idea cloud is now. And yes. even still, like that pulling things off the internet and dropping it into a less. I mean, that's still like the, the at the very least, the spirit of that is still there. And then it's, who's who's to say that even if it's not our project, but another project that you guys do, that that, that will st that may actually happen. That may actually, that may still happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, you know, as I've gone around and I've talked to different instructors, um, you know, this is very much for a particular, uh, a particular medium, which is on this, this online platform. Um, and I think that we're trying to capitalize on that medium. So, you know, all of the, the, images that students are are planting in this mind map we are tagging and we're we're coding behind the scenes so that we can evaluate what they're thinking um, and that's a strength of the particular medium and we're able to kind of uh, show growth over time or change over time to the student based on analytics that again is a strength of the medium um, but Can you give another I, quick example of, uh, of something else that we're on the analytics? I mean, you don't have to go through how the analytics work, but the idea cloud registers change. Is there another kind of thing that happens that would register change within within the lessons or that, that's, that's being built into an, uh, one of the lessons as well? Because I think the analytics thing, I, I mean, obviously there's going to be more things coming out from us in terms of webinars and instructional documents and things like that on how folks can can use or how integrate the lessons again that's another conversation we're going to have in a little bit hopefully but uh, mm -hmm. is there another example of that of the change registering change well yes most of our uh, most of the questions that we ask students uh, have the analytics in the back um, and how they are answering will affect uh, whether or not they are taken to certain screens or uh, are given certain feedback or, you know, will affect the way that DOT interacts with them. Um, so, yes, almost everything that we do has the analytics in the background. Um, most questions feed into changes that are going on. And that's what makes adaptive learning special is that it's not this, um, it feels very linear as all a good learning experience should. You don't want it to feel, um, you know, I, I admire Quentin Tarantino, but I don't think that a learning experience should feel like a Tarantino movie. Oh, in so many ways. Many <laughs> ways. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, we that's, do appreciate good thing. that not being your inspiration. It's more Vim Venture. Um, but playing playing with things out of order, um, it shouldn't ever feel like that. You should feel like you're on this path and that it's one foot in front of the other, so that each student feels like yes, this makes logical sense to me. Um, but behind the scenes, there's so many different ways that they could go with it. Um, you know, they don't see that, um, but it, it does what they're 
answering does affect you know what they're going to see in the lesson. We have mentioned dot a couple times. I want to backtrack and give everybody the 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 if you could again go go as far back as you're willing to go. But I'd love to hear about the invention and creation of dot and how that contributes to personalizing the learning and the process mm -hmm. that a student really goes on uh, throughout the lesson. Mm -hmm. Um. So when we first started working on all of these different lessons, uh, we created uh, some lessons that I think that we were trying to create something that was reflective. I think that we were trying to create something that was very informative. Um, I don't know how personalized it was, um, and I don't know how warm uh, or um, uh, motivational it was and you know I I'm the first one again going back to that failure we we put it out there and um, one of the things and Ed was actually um, the person that said one word that really stuck in my mind and the word was encyclopedic and um, that was really a catalyst to to make some big changes because God, that is the last thing that I want people to be <laughs> thinking <laughs> as they're taking, uh, you know, these lessons on resiliency. So then it really was stepping back and thinking about, okay, what are we, what do we want here? What are we trying to accomplish? And I think one of the big things was I, we wanted, we wanted students to walk away, not just knowing what these different competencies are and what resiliency means. We wanted students to walk away feeling empowered like they are resilient, which they are. <laughs> they, each of these students that's, are resilient. That's the greatest trick that we way. never talk about. Yeah, it's like they already are. They just... <laughs> they already have these things. It's applying it to school. <laughs> yes. They have these things. They may not have confidence in these things. They may not recognize these things, but they're there. And um, and each of these things are innate qualities that human beings are are blessed with. So, you know, really using that and capitalizing on the fact that this is this is something natural for for each and every person. And we started thinking about how how students learn best and and. One of the things that we considered in trying to make it more personal um, was this whole social aspect to learning. And again, not a strength of online learning. Um, I mean, you can go to like message boards and stuff like that, um, but it's sh it's been shown that that students learn through social interactions, through being asked questions, by having someone be curious about what you think and then you have to formulate a response. And, and it, it becomes this um, kind of activity that you go through every time you um, have a conversation with somebody where you're learning more about yourself as well as learning about the other person. Yeah, like that's, so, that's a bit, that's like my favorite part of the of the dot thing is exactly that, that like so it's, it's the, the, the using, especially I think the, the, the idea that, especially for us, because the, the, the workforce that we are developing in particular, if we have a particular one, these are people people, they're service mm -hmm. workers. These are people mm -hmm. that are going to have to work with other people in many cases, in some cases, explicitly hired to help people who need help. So the idea right. that like that, that the, the creation that we're creating an experience where they're actually mimicking in a very sort of limited sense, obviously, but right. like, uh, uh, but we're, we're, we're exploiting that very thing that is driving them to their end goal of a job, which is exactly what you're describing, which I, which when you first talked about this, I was so excited. I was running around in circles and sweating. <laughs> and I think dot, I, I, I think that dot accomplishes. So the character dot is an AI character uh, that we created, and I think the thing that 
it, it was very convenient, actually, because uh, you know that it, this is about resiliency, because it makes so much sense for an AI to be curious about human nature, human soft skills, human uh, emotions, uh, all of these things. It, it's things that Dot wouldn't be able to go on the internet and read a little bit about and, and completely understand. She needs these students. She needs them to explain to her what this is in real life. What does flexibility look like in real life? And it makes the character itself much more believable. Um, it isn't just some some random character. It isn't some, you know, a cute dog or a uh, whatever <laughs> little characters that people make up that do these little interactions. Uh, um, the paper clip, the paper clip that, on. Oh on, my yes. On, like, that word is <laughs> obviously exactly. not happening. Not the um, it was just a perfect marriage between kind of this subject matter and a character who really would be interested in the subject matter. And, um, and so it felt like this natural progression that we would kind of dive off in this area. And instead of making it a quote unquote lesson, we really would try to make it feel more like a conversation. Or that you're teaching, like it's you've flip, flipping the axis where the student is actually kind of teaching, well it is, yes, kind of in teaching, the in the process of teaching something or someone. And that should help with wanting someone to invest more in that development too, right? If you're helping someone in the process while you're learning. Yeah, even for a sense. moment, it's it's like it's engaging a completely different part of your brain and a different part of your self, spirit, whatever you want to think about it. Like it's it's and it's again the 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 voice the calling whatever it was that responded to I want to help people for a living is exactly the button that you're pressing with dot yeah. it's like you're yes. you're activating that record button. Yes, and I and I think that you know I think every conversation is um, I mean if you if you enter into it with an open mind and an you know an open headspace. Every conversation is this back and forth of learning. Um, I'm learning a little bit about you or whatever you're talking about. You learn a, a bit about me and what I'm talking about. And I feel like we're trying to accomplish this as much as possible within the dot lesson. She gives you some information that she's found about the particular topic that is probably very, you know, something that you would just find on the internet. And then she's asking you to really explain this to her, to, to make it make sense in some kind of real way. Because it, it, th these topics are extremely difficult in kind of that theoretical sense. You really do need to kind of make it personal and, and have these like real life uh, experiences that you attach it to, or else it's just strange and abstract. <laughs> It reminds me almost exactly of the peanut butter and jelly. I keep coming back to this as an example. I probably used it on other podcasts, but the peanut butter and jelly good one, uh, programming exercise mm -hmm. um, for that. I know uh, the I, at least the IT people use it, and sometimes I've heard it used in student success situations, where you have to, you know, like the the process that the the that you have to think about. You you have to give. It's, it's the, the give and take that you have with Dot, where Dot gives you something and you give something back. That is replicated mm -hmm. when students have to tell the instructor how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich as if the teacher were a computer or a robot. No and, and, and that sort of failure, success, failure, success conversation. It's the conver it was the word conversation that I kind of glommed onto just now, where it's like that you are that the success and, again, the you know, relatively ubiquitous use of that, you know, in many of our IIT classes kind of speaks to that, the success of that as a, as a, as a model for teaching. Because again, it's, it's, you're not doing anything that is, is divorced from the classroom. Like it's, it's using many of the same, if not exactly the same kinds of techniques, which is again, my, my thinking in terms of asking you about sort of your, your work in a classroom, actually in a classroom. Right. 
because there's mm-hmm. nothing foreign. This isn't the the the, the coming from. yeah the online the sort of like the the looming cloud that at, at least you know uh, you know higher education is going to turn into a giant computerized world that you know the classroom the classroom is going to go away from higher ed that it's like you know, let's for some reason say yes how you know, how five thousand is going to be teaching our kids in forty fifty years <laughs> that like the so what in a way you know like if there did there's what you're doing with adaptive learning is you know what it's challenging that it's 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 not even challenging it's just using the same thing it's the same thing that the it is. is actually kind of the same underneath but with added the the benefits that come from technology and on the surface I think that dot personalizes the learning and experience in such a way that critics of online learning you know would see it as a in impersonal like very separate you know person to computer kind of mediated interaction and so dot really kind of comes along and challenges that perception that people might have of it by personalizing it in a way that Ed's saying is already inherently a part of what you're doing and what people are doing. In the it's classroom. just creative. It's creative. Thing. Yeah, that's I think that I, I get why people are hesitant, uh, especially people that have been teaching a long time. Um, I, I get it. Um, I think that, again, thinking about, you know, I, I'm, I come from an art background. Um, I, I think that, I think in terms of medium, I, I, I think that there are certain, um, there are certain subjects that lend themselves to, to a particular medium. Uh, I would not necessarily do the same thing uh, in, in watercolor that I would uh, do in marble. I just wouldn't. Um, and I think that I can use some of the same techniques. I can use some of the same thought processes. I can solve some of the same problems. But the end result, how I go about doing it, will probably be vastly different. I think that online learning is uh, a particular medium. It's a it's a powerful medium. I don't think it should be ignored. Um, but I think that uh, there are some things that, that especially the social engagement, uh, this, this kind of new wave of uh, thinking about learning as this social construct, um, I think that that is very powerful and it, it's very difficult to replicate online. And so, you know, if instructors think about um, using this, using online, um, you know, platforms as a tool to get certain parts of information across, I, I think that um, they can really then dive in as a facilitator and, uh, and push classroom experiences that you, you can't, it's not just absorp- absorption of information. You're really creating magical experiences then within the classroom that can't be replicated um, on a screen. And um, I'm, I'm all for kind of this blended learning model. I think that online learning frees you up to, uh, to go even further. So um, let's, I want to think about that, in ter- like this talking about the bundles, because the bundles, like the dot lessons are, again, very explicitly based on um, the competency model, again, mm-hmm. flexibility, adaptability, so on and so forth. Now, the, 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 what we've been calling the bundles, you know, our, our jargon that we made up, because <laughs> they were called bundles, and then we're like, what's the name for it? And then we just kept calling it bundles. <laughs> um, the, which is again very <laughs> a good name for it. Uh, yeah, it works. Whatever. So uh, uh, the psychological trauma prevention training, student success, mm-hmm. and IT. Um, mm-hmm. How would you? What are the differences between the three in terms of like how you're delivering or complementing course content? Because in some cases, you're delivering content explicitly. 
And in other cases, you're, again, it's more like the dot lessons where you're doing practice, where the student is mm -hmm. practicing the, the competency rather than, you know, you delivering mm -hmm. it. So if you could talk about the differences between the three and if you want to kind of put them on like a range, like small, medium, large. Well, I think that um, all of them, I, and I think that any good uh, online experience should be integrated very tightly with whatever you're doing in the classroom. Um, you know, the, the psychological trauma lessons were conceived to be kind of lesson zeros. So you would take these lessons before uh, entering into uh, the, the classroom or that particular lesson that the student would be or the instructor would be talking about psychological trauma. Um, so that students, so you kind of get out of the way all of that background knowledge. Um, you, you have a very you have a, at least some uh, conceptual understanding of, of what you're going to be dealing with. And then you have lesson one. So the online lessons are lesson zero. And then lesson one is the, the classroom teacher. And I think what that frees up the classroom instructor to do is to really dive into um, these scripts how did how does this work? How do we practice this well? What does this this look like um, out in the field? And um, that way, they don't have to do all of the background knowledge. They don't have to talk about you know uh, fight, flight, and freeze. They don't have to talk about uh, you know and all of the information that goes behind it because they've already kind of dealt with it. Um, in terms of student success, I think that you have things that really just are kind of like booster shots that uh, students can kind of take and it can help them wherever they're at just kind of be that much better. Um, I think that they can, you can dive deeper into them um, for sure, but I think that they kind of just get students especially students who are, who are um, maybe struggling uh, it, to enter um, into different classes on a level playing field. Um, yeah, kind of leveling the playing field a little bit, um, which I think is really important. And the IT um, lessons, I think that are just a natural extension of what um, the uh, my SMEs have been working on um, at Bunker Hill. Um, they already have this very rich project-based learning approach going on, and so um, we're looking to just create something that complements that and, and kind of nestles in with one of their projects they already have going. I do want to still get to if you have one or two things that you got from what I've been calling the Grand Tour. <laughs> you were you were here on the East Coast uh, a few weeks ago and spoke to a whole bunch of really awesome faculty talking about the flexibility lesson, or that flexibility was the object of inquiry, so to speak. Uh, mm -hmm. But the 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 uh, topic of those conversations was about integration. Uh, I would love to kind of to to record here kind of what you what you were what you kind of came away with in terms of because all of these things are lovely. Obviously, one of the sustain, you know, when we're talking about sustainability, you're talking about instructors actually using these things over and over and over again. So mm -hmm. seamless integration is where is what the conversation was about. So I'd love to hear either ideas that, that instructors gave you in, in those rooms or a, a new way that you're, that you're thinking about it in terms of, you know, what you guys are doing on your end, either one of those things. Uh, well, we uh, we went very focused uh, when uh, I was putting on these workshops. Uh, we were looking at one dot lesson in particular, which is the lesson on flexibility. And so we walked through collectively at each stop along the way. We'd walk through a 
kind of a process of thinking about how to integrate DOT into uh, whatever course they teach, whatever course these instructors were teaching. And I was very excited to see, no matter what the subject matter, once they got, they started really thinking about flexibility, uh, they were able to see where flexibility pops up um, throughout their, their subject matter, throughout their profession. Uh, it, it really became apparent. And, and once they started doing that, um, they could start thinking about, okay, how do we use this lesson kind of as a, um, a foundation to where everybody is speaking the same la language, we're coming from a similar experience? How do we expand upon that? How do we create um, a project or an entire unit that has students really um, digging into how to be a flexible person as a, you know, architect? as a person who works in IT, how are you flexible um, just as a student who is taking a math course? How are, you how are you flexible as a chef? It really started this conversation of, of trying to find um, the resiliency competencies that are there that are hidden beneath the content and they're they're just they are there they're just waiting to be highlighted and exposed for the students um, and so each of the instructors started thinking about how to make uh, those hidden things explicit and how to get students to see instances of their own resiliency and have discussions about where they may be able to improve uh, upon themselves and this is just we had just started when I kind of went around my hope is that we continue to build uh, projects and units where um, you're uh, you're mining through your content area and you're kind of digging up these these diamonds in the rough of resiliency and then polishing them up and making them into these really great learning experiences. Yeah, and that's the, I mean, we haven't really talked about this here, but, you know, I mean, we certainly can have another conversation. I'd love to. But, uh, about sort of on the technical side uh, in terms of the, and again, this might be probably, it's probably going to be more of a webinar thing, the, the how on the back of the, what I've been calling in my head the back of the house stuff where, um, the feedback that a student would get, especially as they move through the dot lesson, can be can be specific to the architect, chef, you know, nurse, you know, ditch digger, whatever they're doing. You know that like the that the the flexibility lesson can be outfitted to the degree that the instructor feels motivated and inspired to do. Obviously, in and of itself already what I what I'm excited about I guess is that instructors engaged with the flexibility lesson and saw themselves reflected in it they saw their students more importantly maybe even more so reflected in it and that they have ideas about how it really can be input in it that there is no difference Again, getting that was something that we talked about earlier that the, the, there is no difference between what what is happening in the classroom and what is happening on the screen in terms of the 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 sort of the germ or the DNA of what the you know you as an instructor and them as an instructor are doing. And that mm -hmm. that's sort of the the I think the you know for me if I'm talking to other people explaining what Smart Sparrow is that's usually the thing I try to come back to or try to emphasize is that that this isn't just you know, like, I don't know, this is probably my only point of reference is where in the world is Carmen San Diego as a kid was my favorite thing to do. And I now know <laughs> a bunch of capitals of random like Djibouti and stuff, like because <laughs> yeah. I was engaging with a dot like, you know, idea. And again, that was what in the 80s, you know, like this idea of successful educational 
you know, the, the educational pedagogy that, that informs online, you know, you're looking at a computer screen and learning is always so much about sort of the, the, the it's the process of moving from task to task to task that like that there, there the, is, is informed by the classroom. It doesn't mimic the classroom. It is very, it's one and the same. It's not, it's not like, a, you know, tofu or something it's really it's really giving sort of the real sort of educational protein that was a terrible metaphor i don't know why I started with it. <laughs> but whatever um yeah does that sound like is that am I, did i make any sense just now i don't know what happened <laughs> uh it's always such a pleasure to talk to you i think i wandered away from myself just then tofu, carbon, San Diego. Yeah, carbon San Diego. <laughs> that's the name of my new album.